Today we're going to be talking about hunting mobile ac rogue access points. And uh, so it's a, kind of the same methodology, but we've, we've beefed it up just a bit. Uh, I'm Todd Parody. I'm Minnie. We're out of Colorado. We're both pen testers, and we like to do stuff on the side for fun. So none of the things that we're going to talk about today reflect anything about our employers. This is all a personal project, um, especially any opinions or jokes we might make. These were not approved by our employers. All right. <clears throat> so first of all, whenever we give this presentation, we like to just set the stage so that you know, everybody understands what we're talking about. What is a rogue access point? A uh, rogue access point is something, is a wireless access point that's either misconfigured or maliciously configured and exists in a hardware baseline that you don't want it there. So the idea is you want to find these and get rid of them. Um, they come in all sorts of forms. You know, you have sysadmins that set up a, an old Netgear router hoping to get stuff done and they leave it open. Or you have a retail shop that installs a wireless extender and they authenticate to your WPA2 main hub and anybody else can access that extender because it is broadcasting open, and boom, right behind the network. So these, these, these are real threats in uh, terrestrial networks and they, are, uh, they require some specific tactics to find out. So last year, Minnie and I talked about hunting the, the stationary APs. Uh, there's a link here that uh, I guess we'll post the, the slides on the Wireless Villages page. You follow the link, watch our, our talk from last year. Uh, we won't talk too much about it, but this year we're talking about mobile rogue APs. These are the foxes. Um, if you're competing in the CTF, if you've ever competed in the CTF, you know that this is one of the challenges. Go out and find a wireless access point that's roaming around. Now this presents its own challenges uh, because in order to find it, whatever gear you have with you, that antenna pattern has to match the antenna pattern of what you're, what you're searching for. At least they have to be in the same vicinity. So you could spend a ton of time on your feet looking for a fox and never pick up its signal if, if you're not doing things right. Um, and if you go back and, and, and watch our talk from last year, it's pretty much what happened. We just walked around a lot. If you think about Caesar's Palace uh, blueprints, and if you put a Roomba on that blueprint, that's pretty much what we did. It just went back and forth until we, we found the, the stationary AP. So mobile, hunting mobile APs takes on its own form um, because you can, you can go back and forth just like a Roomba would uh, to try to cover your entire search space, but if you're not in the same place as the fox, you're going to miss them. Um, so it's attacker controlled. The, the attackers got the, the hardware on themselves. So for any sort of hunting, what do you, what do you need? What, what, are the, what are the key pieces of information that you need to, to go out and hunt the rogue AP? Um, you have to be able to identify your target. Here in the wireless CTF, the organizers post a uh, BSS ID, and that's it. They'll just give you a BSS ID. They don't tell you the frequency. They don't tell you the channel. And you've got to go out and find it. So you have to at least start with a BSS ID. And a lot of folks will pick this up like in, if they're doing this threat hunting for real, um, they'll have some indication that something's wonky in their environment and, and they'll, they'll be able to pull uh, a BSS ID and that's what they start from. Um, so it's better if you have a frequency in a channel because you narrow your search space, uh, you can tune your gear a lot easier that way. But you also have to deal with a bunch of structural and wireless interference. So you may need different types of antennas, directionals. Um, in our talk last year we talked about not using Yagi's for these types of hunting. Um, it's kind of cool, looks cool. You're walking around with this big thing that looks like a, a sniper rifle, um, but it actually makes the search a lot harder. Because remember, your, your antennas, your radiation patterns have to overlap. And if you've got a soda straw that you're just pointing around in whatever direction, then uh, it's gonna be really difficult to find somebody else's donut. And here, especially this year, um, for the contest, you have a huge space to cover. Uh, last year we talked about uh, Caesar's Palace, something like 60 acres of space, 30,000 people, um, 600, 600 floors of rooms, so I, just tons of space to cover. And this year we're across three different casinos, so you can just imagine the, 
how that scales up. Um, so, coming off our success from DC 25, finding the stationary access point, Minnie and I decided that we were done walking around. Like, we were going to cut that out of our strategy immediately. Um, I get shin splints really easy. I've got flat feet, and Minnie's got a, a bum knee. So, <laughs> we were done walking, and we thought, okay, how, how do we approach this in a smart way? Um, so, our idea was let's just sit still, uh, or at least relatively still. Let's deploy some sort of sensor that, uh, that can just stay in one place, and somehow we get notified. Uh, well, one way to do that is like just get a huge team of people, 12 plus people, everybody gets a Raspberry Pi and you're on ham radio and you all go out to, to your, your different locations. Well, guess what? People are unreliable and they suck at communicating. So we needed something that we could control, something that had a protocol that made sense to us that we could check out and, and would work, you know, nine times out of 10. Of course, we wanted 10 out of 10, but Nine times out of ten is good enough for us. So with that in mind, um, traditional hunting takes, you know, walking around but using direction finding. And that's still important to us. Even though we didn't want to walk around, we, we still have to eventually use traditional methods. Uh, so the idea is once we deploy a, uh, an automated non-human sensor network, and at this point we still didn't know what that would be, we're going to narrow down our search space and be notified where we need to be next. And hopefully we're somewhat close to where we need to be next. Um, and, and we thought that might make things just a little more efficient. So another thing that, that we needed to make sure is that we kept our costs down. Like I said at the beginning, Minnie and I bankrolled this whole project ourselves and we're pretty poor, so we just we had to keep all of our costs down. Um, also, we had to keep our costs down for this last point um, because we needed to make these things concealable, uh, at least to compete in the wireless CTF. Uh, we wanted to be able to place whatever these sensors, uh, wh whatever these sensors would be, we want to be able to place them places that we didn't have to have physical security over, right? That, that we could just leave them there. And it's DEF CON, there's a bunch of thievery happening here. If you guys see things on the, on the walls or on tables, you're probably going to pick it up. Um, now this is important because we could have built out this whole strategy I've described so far by just buying a bunch of uh, Aruba access points or uh, Cisco Enterprise access points because they have this functionality built into them. Uh, if you deploy enough of them, they can build out a two-dimensional heat map and you can see you know, relatively where uh, specific users, specific uh, access points are. Um, but at $500 to $1,500 a, a wireless access point, we didn't want those just walking off here at DEF CON. So our, our approach was a low cost, quick, pro rapid prototype of a deployable um, and unmanned sensor network. So after doing some research, trying to figure out what devices kind of fit that model, we came across the ESP8266. How, how many of you ever played around with this before. It's, it's gaining popularity. Uh, the ESP family of, of wireless chips has been around at least the DEF CON scene for a long time. Uh, the last several years, uh, some of the badges have featured uh, ESPs, ESP32s, um, and then obviously a lot of the, the indie badges feature that, that same chip. Um, there's a lot of functionality in them. For us, the ESP32 was a little more expensive than what we wanted. I think it came in at about a $15 uh, a node price, and we wanted to keep costs extremely low. So if you see here, uh, it, it's three bucks. You get it on Amazon, you know, three dollars, no big deal. Um, and that was the building block for our, our whole sensor network. Um, these were released in 2014. Uh, somebody out of China was manufacturing them. Nobody here really caught wind of it except if, if you were like really into hardware hacking. Um, and then Hackaday picked up the ESP8266 for one of their, um, one of their pieces. And there was a great article on, on what they did, were able to do with the 8266. Because uh, it's, it's pretty unique. You know, at $3 you get almost 20 dB out of this tiny little chip that's powered by 3.3 volts. So in open space, some people have done tests and it reaches uh, client to to the wireless access point is about 300 meters. 
So it's, it's got a really, really good radiation pattern. Um, and even better, in the, in the chip is all the functionality that you need to, uh, to, to, to run uh, WPA and WPA2. So that meant that we didn't have to write that from scratch, which was really important for me because I'm a horrible coder, uh, really important for Mini because I didn't want to turn him into a slave during this project. So uh, the ESP8266 has two GPIO uh, transmit and, and receive serial pins. Uh, this is really neat for debugging because uh, we can just see, we can print stuff out, uh, you know, just like uh, really rudimentary debugging, entering our own print lines, seeing what's going on. Um, but it also allows us to combine multiple ESPs if we wanted to or put other sorts of sensors on it um, so that we can read and control what's going on. So this this quickly became our, our number one choice for, for how we would build this network out. It's got a 32-bit RISC processor on it. Um, you can overclock it up to 160 megahertz. And uh, one of the limitations is it only has a meg of RAM, and that's for both uh, program code and user data. So uh, that's, it may not seem like it now, but when you're dealing with wireless stuff, that's very small. Um, so our ability to, to just dump a bunch of logic onto this is, is slim. Um, it runs on 3.3 volts, which means you can power it with a, uh, you know, just a little tiny coin cell. Um, a lot of the projects that you'll find online for 8266 is a bunch of IoT stuff. You've got a bunch of farmers who are monitoring their water flows and uh, folks who are watering plants and a lot of watering going on with uh, 8266s because uh, they, they act as a wireless access point themselves um, and they run uh, natively. If you just bought this right now, this little guy, and it came to you in Amazon, uh, over Amazon, you just powered it up on 3.3 volts, it's got a full uh, web server running on it. So it's really plug and play. You just start working with it, um, access the website, you can kind of uh, build it to suit your needs just, just from there. Um, yeah, so if, if you hadn't seen one before, that's, that's about how small it is. Um, picture does not depict actual size. I forgot to put that up there. Um, indoors, it has a pretty limited range what wireless doesn't because you're dealing with a bunch of concrete and steel and here you're dealing with a bunch of water because all the humans walking around. You got about 80% water. That's a, a lot of attenuation happening. Um, and if you're running, if you're using the wireless chipset the entire time, it's super power hungry. So this, what we ended up learning as we built these is these coin cells running with our code base lasted about 15 minutes, which was awesome. And then it got really, really hot. Yeah. So if you had little tiny robin eggs, you could crack them on top of the chip and you'd have you know, breakfast for a minute. Um, the other limitation uh, is it's 2.4 gigs only. That's the only band that it, that it operates on, which is a limitation for the contest because uh, there's a ton of stuff in the wireless CTF that is on five gigs. So that's just completely out of the ballpark for us. Um, but it makes a really good proof of concept. So if we decide that we can stomach a, a more cost per node, we can upgrade that to a dual band chip and, and move on. So I want to kind of walk you through a, a bit of kind of history, lessons learned, or just a journey of the 8266 that we, since we picked this up uh, last year about uh, December of 2017 is when we, we started this project so that we could compete last year in the wireless CTF. Um, the 8266 didn't have a lot of documentation online. Um, what it did have was inconsistent between uh, different sources. Uh, even worse, the tooling was just not even there. So development boards didn't really exist uh, for, for this specific model. Now for the 32, they're all over the place, but this really cheap model wasn't a lot of resources available to us. So we ended up having to you know, go back to our electrical engineering days and remind ourselves what a breadboard is. And uh, so this, this was our first kind of development uh, board. The idea was, since we were building a, a, a network of sensors, uh, we needed at least three. One to act as the root node and two more so we could see how they communicated with each other. Uh, so this allowed us to program and run the, the chips all on the same board, just made it a lot more simple. Um, 
even more simple is how you interact with the 8266, is flashing firmware, powering it off, putting it into um, operational mode. It's just these two buttons. Um, well, it's, it's a pull down and a pull up on uh, two of the GPIO pins, but we use these buttons to perform that, and a certain pattern of using those puts the chip into program mode, so you can take all your, your uh, you take your entire program, load it on, uh, flash it, and then it resets automatically, and then it's automatically in operational mode. So whatever code you're running, you're seeing it happen right there. So if you're changing the access point, right after it flashes, that access point name is gonna pop up. Um, so it's really quick, a lot of fun. Um, later on, we improved our, our design for our development board. This is the next one on the left. Um, we needed them to be individual nodes. We are now ready to go out and deploy these and test them more. So um, on that board on the right is just a five volt FTDI that uh, has a power regulator on it that takes it down to, a voltage regulator that takes it down to 3.3 volts. Um, at $3 a piece, they're pretty, uh, I mean, what do you expect? They're dainty. So if you put 3.39 volts into it, they're going to fry. So it's important that your, your voltage regulator is sound, and we found that this one was really good. Um, and that was 2017. Uh, earlier this year, on the right, it, uh, somebody on Amazon uh, or somebody released on Amazon their own USB to ESP UART adapter, which I cursed at because I really wanted that at the end of 2017. Um, it would have made things a lot easier. You see there's a switch on the side instead of two bun buttons. Makes it so much faster, smoother development. Um, and that's $8. That whole thing comes with an ESP8266 and the development board. That's why I gave you a link. If you want to get started with this, it honestly just costs you $8. Um, and it's a great way to dive down into the, the actual beacons and, and packets and frames that are coming in and out of the 802.11 space. Um, which, you know, we've competed in the wireless CTF the last two and a half, two and a half years. We didn't do it this year. Um, and I can't tell you that I ever once actually looked into a, uh, like a, a packet and pulled out the beacon. Um, I just used tools to do it. So it was really fun to kind of get our hands dirty and, and really get down to the protocol level quickly, cheaply, um, and now with a lot more documentation and support out there. So anyways, that's kind of part of the journey. Um, after, after we were done developing, we had to go back to that requirement of making our, our nodes, our sensor nodes, uh, concealable, right? Because you all be thieving. So we needed to make sure you couldn't find them, or if you did see them, you didn't think they were anything valuable. We even got to the point of talking about putting uh, Cyrillic characters inside of our code in case anybody dumped the firmware, so they thought that uh, you know, it was coming from somewhere in Eastern Europe. Um, the NSA actually has their own OUI. OUI is the first three uh, bytes of the, the MAC address for, the, uh, for your chip. And so we thought about setting our, our MAC address to the NSA's OUI, but uh, many talked some sense into me and said that probably wouldn't be a good idea because there might be some legal things that we don't know about. But anyways, it's public. You can go look it up. Just go to an OUI database and type in NSA and it's there. Um, anyways, I digress. So, um, so we needed to build our concealables. So we went from the board you saw in the previous one on the right, uh, which allows us just to take that ESP out back in uh, to our deployable, as we call them, on the left. Uh, we upgraded from the nickel cell to uh, lithium ion uh, batteries. This one is a 3.3 volt, and I think it's a 1200, uh, I don't know what it was in terms of amperage, um, but it was enough to last longer than 15 minutes. These lasted us about two hours. So um, we rolled through those batteries pretty quick. Uh, but this is just a case. It's a, it's a utility case that you, you might install at your house or something. And we found that with all the heat that was generated, this wasn't a great idea because there's no way to ventilate all the heat. So that plastic got really hot. And the last thing we wanted to do was cause another fire. Well, we didn't cause a fire, but and they're a little big. have another fire they're a little big at DEF CON. Too. Yes. And these are a little big, right? Um, Not huge. 
I had one earlier, yeah. but they're about this big. Yeah. Right? About the size of the fish I caught too. All right, so uh, we realized probably not an ideal form factor, so we shrunk it even more. Um, here's, here's what they look like now. Uh, I don't By have the way, Todd's built. acting like he planned all this, but he actually just decided that we were going to start using the coin cells like right in the middle of the CTF. Yeah, that was, yeah, it was, so, a, it was a flexible choice. Yeah. <laughs> it was ad hoc. Yeah. Um, and so it's just this little coin cell holder. These were for nodes that we were okay with deploying for 15 minutes, going and picking up, and then uh, resetting. Um, I've, got a, I've got a whole box of ESPs here. I don't know if you can see it. And, Come uh, up afterwards. Yeah, if you'd like one, I'm happy to give them away, um, the ones that we're not using now. So, I, I, in fact, I've got a... That, that whole programming board, I've got an extra one. So come talk to me if you'd like it. Um, and then that is blue masking tape on the battery bank that you see on the left, and it works perfectly. It distributes heat unimaginably. All right, and then uh, we just had Velcro on the bottom, so we would stick these, and I think, yep, uh, we stuck these everywhere. Uh, we stuck them under tables, behind chairs, behind the pillars on the walls. Um, TV. TVs underneath, we came into the wireless village and, and stuck them underneath the tables um, for purposes we'll explain later. And uh, yeah, so that's, that was kind of our deployment strategy. Um, I, I, my goal with this kind of introduction, I'm about to turn the time over to Minnie, uh, was if you hadn't heard of the ESP8266 to kind of give you an introduction to it, uh, it's an awesome little chip. A great way to get started with wireless stuff, either if you just need a wireless access point or if you want to do some of the more cool things that you can do with uh, the software that you load on that, that Minnie's going to talk about um, and then kind of show you our, our progress for our methodology and, and, and what brought us to the, the form factor and, and the deployment that, that we had here. So at this point, Minnie, I'm going to turn this over to you and Minnie's going to talk to us about software considerations. So yeah, like Todd was saying, we were just looking for something super straightforward that I could get started with, um, with a relatively shallow knowledge of wireless and 802.11. I'm not like a wireless expert. I'm sure all of these fine people over here could tell you a lot more than I could. So I was just looking to prototype something really quick, find something with some open source software out there that I could fork and just bootstrap in and start writing firmware on the fly. Um, obviously I wanted to flash it quick. Um, I had no idea what I was doing with the hardware. If I destroyed it in some manner, I didn't want it to matter. So that, that happened several times, but that's why we work as a team because I got to build the new hardware that uh, <laughs> Mini destroyed. So. <laughs> um, so we used this prototype uh, software at the time called Painless Mesh uh, that a guy named Gmag wrote, and basically you have a centralized root and it dynamically forms a uh, wireless topology based on some kind of shortest path algorithm in the background. And so our leaves are obviously just those little implants out there. And uh, yeah, that was, that was really it. What I'm trying to demonstrate here is that you have to have a root node in order to make this work. So we ended up putting this on uh, just a little Raspberry Pi with an LED screen and carried it around. Uh, so for the root node, we wanted to we ended up getting to a point where we wanted, since they kept sending out foxes, to dynamically introduce BSS IDs and have the opportunity to remove them at a later date if we needed to or cl clear everything and start over from scratch. So we just took a Python script, hooked it up over serial on our, our root node and uh, sent it a JSON blob and propagated that blob over the mesh to the slaves. And then we came up with a kind of uh, just a pseudo TCP Synac data flow, I suppose you could say, just to make sure that the message gets out and that the bots acknowledge the message and that we're actually hunting for the thing that we're looking for, or the things, plural. And um, then, you know, you could probably forward the bot data into like a cool web app or something. Uh, but there's only a team of two, so we didn't really get to that. But there was another project on GitHub that I got some help from. Um, it's mentioned in the README somewhere. I can't remember what it's called. But he did some pretty cool visualizations with uh, the wireless traffic for s sniffing on uh, just a, like a single 
ESP. Uh, so for the, the bots, like I said, going into this, I didn't even know that I couldn't run promiscuous mode at the same time as station AP mode. So I was like, oh, oops, I have to put this into a, a kind of like a bimodal uh, functionality. So using the task, it's, a, it's like an asynchronous task scheduler, which is a fancy way of saying uh, you write these uh, responsibilities that the bots are supposed to achieve at any given time, like channel hopping or reinitialization to the mesh network or um, uh, signal acknowledgments to the other bots. Um, and yeah, that was, that, was, that was kind of a learning experience. So we came up with this kind of um, bimodal functionality in short. And uh, we also found a necessity to kind of change the, w when we found a target, we needed to send out an alert. And th that kind of, with the way the topology changes when the mesh reconnects, we had to kind of change the way that the software is functioning so that the message could get across the mesh network uh, as expediently as possible. So we ended up leveraging some strategies with uh, NTP, network time protocol, and <coughs> yeah, keeping everything in synchronization uh, in, the, in those, those bimodal segments at the same time so that each bot was doing the same thing at the same time, if that makes sense. And we'll talk more about that in a second. So this is just the basic duty cycle. So d by default, 20,000 milliseconds, communicating over the mesh, renegotiating topology, getting information about NTP synchronizations, and then for nine seconds going to promiscuous and continuously scanning, looking for the beacons uh, in the just frames, basically 802.11 frames in the air that you're trying to hunt. And then here's the root duty cycle. We're handling communications between the mesh, uh, synchronization with MTP, obviously, with the, with the bots, and uh, sending responses to alerts, acknowledging that we've, um, that we've found a target or not, and saving cycles since these things are already so power hungry. And I'm calling this NTP magic because it was all built in a painless mesh, and I can't take credit for implementing it. But Basically, you take the duty cycle time and then you offset that with, uh, with the current NTP synchronization interval. And that basically just allows everything to do what I call synchronized swimming, where like we were talking about before, they're communicating at the same time and then they're all scanning at the same time so that when someone finds something, um, they can automatically jump into a hey, I found your target alert mode screaming at the air and the rest of the mesh continues to do what it's doing and then the message will come over as soon as the rest of the mesh network gets back into synchronization. Um, so this is just a short video. Um, I do apologize. We were trying to get a live demo together and we had some upstream dependency issues that kind of broke. Um, is, that, is that playing, Todd? How do you play that? Uh, yeah, just hit play. All right, so you got to give it a sec. So basically on the left and the right, we're just monitoring serial of two of these bots. And um, what I want you guys to see is them entering the promiscuous mode at the same time and also communicating over the mesh at the same time, making NTP negotiations. It takes a sec. Yeah, this was kind of one of the hardest things that we had to wrap our heads around because sometimes there'd be interference where a, a leaf wouldn't be able to, or a bot as we call them, wouldn't be able to communicate back to the root node. So independently, it still needed to be in sync with the rest of the mesh. And yeah. So the, the bot initialization, um, it's in mesh communication mode right now. And there's actually a lot of back end calls that are happening. You can change the debug level on the painless mesh library to get more granular view of the things that are actually taking place. Oh, and then there's beacons. And it's actually capturing the whole 802.11 frame and we ended up having to capture uh, probe requests too because they, they had a uh, fox where you actually had to capture the source BSS ID of who was making a probe. Um, so we had to kind of change our tactics later on in the CTF for that as well. So right now it's just a conditional block, looks for a, um, 
beacon that's in an array of BSS ID targets that you're looking for and then if it doesn't find the beacon it'll check the probe. And so the, the waterfall of data that you're seeing here just like Minnie was saying is, is the beacons that we're capturing in sniffing mode and then we do that for 20 seconds and then they go back into uh, mesh communication mode. I think you had a better name for it. Mesh communication mode works. Awesome. <laughs> I'll take credit for that. Uh, and this looks like a duplicate slide. My bad. <laughs> so these are just the JSON blobs, the data we're sending back to the root node and then we just put some directional arrows on there to indicate that while we didn't have to do as much walking as we did in the stationary hunt, uh, we still had kind of a um, patrol that we would do so that we had a higher likelihood of capturing the operator on the move. And you can see here that we didn't deploy these all over Caesars. This was a proof of concept for us. So the limitation here is that our, n our mesh network would only work for us in the one specific place that we deployed it, which this is kind of a map of the, the hallway right around the wireless CTF from last year. And so that was, you know, obvious, an obvious limitation of, of what we did. Yeah, and granted, you could consolidate all your root nodes and create a uh, distributed C2 strategy if you wanted to. It wouldn't be a huge push up. Uh, this is the alert mode I was talking about. So basically, like I was saying, it stops everything it's doing and it just starts screaming at the rest of the network, indicating that it's found the target. And it does that for a certain amount of time before it receives uh, an acknowledgement from the root and then it also sends back a finish acknowledgement back to the root to tell the root to shut up and get back to its, its job of um, listening to as much traffic as possible. And then it resynchronizes with the same NTP offsets and goes back to its default uh, uh, communication mode with the mesh. All right. So on the left here, uh, this is a bunch of traffic on the root node over serial. So you can see the different connections that we're making uh, wirelessly with, with our slaves. And then on the right, uh, I don't know if you guys can see it in the upper right hand corner, that's going to be an updater script where we're updating the root over serial before s the root sends out commands to the rest of the bots in the mesh. And then on the bottom right I was just using that as an indicator to synchronize uh, the videos because there's, there's another video that's overlaid on top of this if you give us a sec. We're not great video editors. Don't judge us. <laughs> okay, so yes, I sent a target. Um, that's a MAC address right there. Um, and that's a real MAC address of one of my devices. Anyways, the root is acknowledging with the JSON blob that uh, it's, it's received it and it's sent it over the mesh. I'm just printing out the JSON on the left there. So now these nodes are actually hunting. Is the overlay video going to play now? Is it? <laughs> there it is. All right, so we're in a library. Um, and as you can see, there's one of our nodes connected to a Chromebook. And I'm going back to my root next to Spider-Man. And we're trying to show you guys here that there's no smoke and mirrors. And when it catches a target, it's going to spit out something in the Python monitor script on the left that's green, indicating that it's found one of its targets. And we also wrote a script uh, where it goes through, oh, there it goes. And Todd's about, I don't know if there he's over, he's over there. Like, oh, what, 50 meters away or so? Probably like 50 feet, yeah. Yeah. And this is pretty basic, you know, you just have one slave out there. Uh, you probably can't see it from back there, but the last number on the right of that highlighted green is the RSSI value. It's negative 85. Yeah, and now it's negative 78. And so, yeah, the script we wrote, you can also pull that out and go straight into arrow dump. So we also had an alpha card and we would just dump that BSS ID straight in and start hunting. But for demonstration purposes, we kept it in monitor mode. Yeah, that's when we'd switch into just the traditional hunting direction finding. Um, but one, one really neat thing about the way that we deployed these and just, I mean, it wasn't anything we did, it's just the theory behind it is 
uh, with, especially with the RSSI values and the different nodes that are communicating back, at that point we can establish direction, right? So if we're in a hallway and everybody's going that way, but our signal is coming back to us saying that, hey, the signal's getting stronger and each subsequent node is telling us it's right there, and we're just looking for the people or person that's just walking towards us, and that's when we kind of switch into the traditional mode and, and uh, get on our feet. Um, Oh, there we go. And uh, we thought this was interesting. While we were doing the CTF, we had noticed other people were putting these things. This is not ours. Other people were putting these out in the field for shenanigans like deauthentication. Um, we got really frustrated at the end of the hunt because we hadn't found any foxes. So we just downloaded, what's his name? Space Hoon? Yeah. Space, Space Hoon's uh, beacon spamming software and started beacon spamming out the target BSS IDs around the, in and around the village just to drive the other teams crazy. Yeah, so you heard that right. We, we didn't find the fox, so I, I hope we didn't say that at the yeah, beginning. Yeah, like, here's There's how no you find a fox. Here. This is just kind of our approach. We thought it was cool and novel. Um, and we did get very frustrated, and, uh, but we got kind of our... We wasted a bunch of some of these guys' time. Yes, it was vindictive for us. Um, at least two people went chasing our signal, and, and many did something very evil. He set a delay in when the, the beacon would spam, so it wouldn't just be constant. It would be like every seven seconds you'd get a, a, a beacon spam for three it, seconds. It was, it was every 25 seconds, okay. and it would be for like two seconds. You'd just get a little blip. 25 seconds is long enough for you to think that, okay, I'm, I'm going to go out in that hallway, and I'm going to go down this way, and then before you know it, your signal's gone. Uh, yeah, so we, we watched people yeah, we watched and the desperation teams. in their face is they went out into the hallway thinking they found it and then it just disappeared and just their face went white. Oh, and white. then we targeted that team from Idaho. Do you remember the gentleman yeah. with the white beard? Yeah, and yeah. That Hunter <laughs> tablet. We kind of followed him over and then we placed one of them behind the TV. We knew one of the goons and he was like losing his mind for a good 20 minutes. We kind of felt, did we apologize to him? Yeah. Okay. So since... We basically came up with this little scheme to have a what I call a Wi-Fi C2, if you will. Um, it'd be really cool to apply the distributed model to the stuff that's already out there for the ESP8266 software, like the beacon spamming, and instead of just throwing them out there and beacon spamming, to actually have uh, some level of control and feedback. Uh, Deauth would be cool too. Um, I mean, I'm not gonna like suggest it to anyone, but. I'll just say, just imagine if you place these outside, if someone placed these outside of like an enterprise or something like that, and just like sat in their car and screwed around with the Python script for a couple hours, you could like, you could probably, I mean, theoretically, I'm not suggesting anything to anyone, but it'd be kind of fun. So for the future, um, we were thinking 802.11 is maybe one of the reasons we didn't find the foxes. There was like, there's just so much saturation, there's so many pineapples, and there's so much shenanigans. Uh, some of the times we couldn't even get like traffic back from the mesh, depending on where we deployed it. Um, yeah, and the yeah. way that that looked in the spectrum, so like if you were using regular tools like AeroDump, what you would see is every 20 seconds, uh, an access point would stand up on one of our ESPs, and yeah. it was called test and production, yeah. I think. <laughs> and so you would see that pop up, um, but folks who are walking around with pineapples that are, that are uh, doing what's called karma mode, where they're just responding to every single beacon as if they are a legitimate access point, are stealing those handshakes, right? Or stealing those, those initial um, uh, connection attempts. So whenever we would stand up in station AP mode, our theory is, we, we didn't collect the data on this, you know, while we were doing it, but our theory is that uh, we would lose connection because our, our node would try to connect to that, uh, that karma response. Um, so 802.11 really is not a, a, a great protocol. Uh, you know, Wi-Fi is not a great protocol to, to backhaul all your communications back to the root node on. Um, obviously, we're going to use it to sniff and, and all of this stuff. Um, but there's some better options out there. I think we yeah, have... In terms it. of reliability, I mean, for obvious reasons, in an environment like this that's so hostile, it's just probably not the best choice, but it's great for a quick and dirty POC. Otherwise, um, we're thinking about 
switching it up to something more expensive that Todd was thinking about? Yeah, well, like, if we could just stomach more money just walking away with each node, if somebody walked away with it, then we could do a lot more. Um, we could build this into dual band. Um, LoRa is, is great for, would be our backhaul communications. We'd, we'd do that over, I forget what frequency it is, but um, we could use LoRa for backhaul. And uh, obviously, you know, battery packs and, and all of that and, and casings and however we concealed it. Uh, we could definitely dump more money into it, but for us, we wanted to uh, keep costs low and be able to test, deploy, and uh, interact with it pretty quick. So in the future, if, if we can do that, uh, we might seek out a, a dual band uh, chip to do that with, but that's at like $30 just starting, um, sometimes more. Um, if, if you know of any, please tell us. <laughs> we, uh, maybe our research is just poor. We haven't found it yet, but um, a $3 dual band chip would be ideal. Yeah, yeah, we were thinking about just, um, well, should we talk about the other idea about clustering the ESPs together? Yeah, yeah. so um, switching between the modes takes a lot of power. Um, and you get all, you get, there's a lot of overhead, too. There is. Things are running on a single thread. And you're taking, Even though it's asynchronous, you know, it's just pseudo-asynchronous. It's basically like coding in the 90s, I guess whatever that's like. Right, you're taking up most of that one meg uh, code uh, RAM. That one meg RAM is just being eaten up by both of your, your processes for going from station mode to uh, sniffing mode. So you could just distribute that over two ESPs and put them in the same box. Um, doubles your cost of a node because that's you know, two ESPs, not a big deal. Uh, but now you have more processing power available to you. Yeah, and, and they can just communicate over serial to you. And we could uh, you sleep one chip while yeah. the other one's monitoring, and you save power that way too. So, yeah, definitely. Uh, but obviously, implications with going with the hardware Todd's, Todd's talking about. We'd have to yeah. roll our own code and stop copying other people's stuff, which is actually the reason we didn't have a live demo today. Uh, five days ago, somebody committed an uh, update to one of the libraries we were dealing with and what we know is we didn't track our dependencies well and the last time that the compiled version worked was May so it's on GitHub and it's MIT so like yeah. you guys can take it and do whatever you want with it all we know is back in May it was working fine yep and uh, so if we had our own painless mesh library obviously we'd be testing any changes there uh, but we rushed into it didn't version stuff and shit broke yeah and just we want to tip our hat for uh, all the people who wrote a lot of these lower level libraries for the ESPs and for all the other talkers that did such an awesome job here and for having us. Thank you guys very much. Yeah. Do um, you guys yeah. have any questions? No? All right. We got two. Way back there. I, oh, I can't hear you, dude. Just yell. The BLE? Yeah, uh, that was an option, but cost prohibitive. Um, if you, did you say, so I, I'm going to repeat the question, make sure I got it right. Did we think about using BLE for communication across nodes? Yes. Cost prohibitive for us uh, because we had to sniff with the wireless chip anyways. So putting another uh, chip on there. Thirty-two does. He yes. said the thirty-two has BLE. Eighty-two sixty-six is like a stripped-down Honda Civic, right? ESP thirty-two is like an elite Hyundai. <laughs> you know, it's still not like the best, but you you do get BLE with it, which would be a great idea. If if I wasn't so cheap, I probably would do that. Great question. Yes. No. Can you repeat the question, Todd? Yeah. Uh, did we have a, a linear regulator that... Right. Yeah, we just plugged it straight in. We were like, let's go. So, so that may have been part of our power usage issue, for sure. Okay. Thank you.
Other Thank question you. up here? Yeah. So the, so the the question was if the uh, current constraints of the hardware limited the amount of beacons we were able to parse, and the answer was, I mean, it depends on how fast you're hopping channels, and um, we didn't really have a baseline to measure it against. But from what I could tell, compared to just standard arrow dumps um, with an alpha card and a laptop, it was actually um, it pulled out a good amount of data. Yeah, we weren't storing the every single beacon correct. We were just churning through it and comparing the uh, beacon address. I don't know. You you wrote that yeah. logic. What did we do? Yeah. yeah, yeah. We were just looking for the beacon. BS yeah, we just ID. compare it. If it was the right one, then we and we the probes it. eventually. Yeah. yeah. So, any other questions? Okay. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Enjoy guys. The rest of your DEF CON.